Good morning, church family. Good to see every single one of you. Uh, even though it's cloudy and rainy outside, we know that the sun is always shining in our hearts, and for that we rejoice. Uh, we welcome if you we welcome you if, if you're visiting with us uh, this morning, and we encourage you uh, to take one of those blue cards that are in front of you, fill that out and pass it to uh, the center aisle just so we can get to know you and, um, and know that you're here and express um, how grateful we are that you were here. Uh, well, we understand that if, if you are visiting, it can be um, awkward, it can be a little bit weird um, coming to a church for the first time, but we want you to feel welcomed uh, and, and we're just so blessed um, that, that you are here with us this morning. We know that throughout life, as we experience it in real time, that it's filled with both good news and bad news. It's such a blessing whenever we are experiencing good news, uh, it, it causes our hearts to rejoice. Uh, just a week ago, one of our brothers, uh, Joel, now a brother in Christ, was baptized into Jesus Christ. That was good news. That was cause for rejoicing. Uh, my cousin who lives in Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, he, he and his wife just recently had a baby girl. Um, so precious, so adorable, and it just makes Anna, Anna and I uh, all the more excited uh, for, for the arrival of our son. Uh, but that's, that's such good news uh, to hear of the announcement of, of a birth, of a wedding. Life, life is filled with uh, with good news, and when we hear soul-refreshing good news, it, it gives us cause to rejoice. But on the flip side of the coin, we know at the same time that life is filled with much bad news and many sorrows, and especially in 2020. 2020 has been kind of a roller coaster, hasn't it? It all, it's, it, it's almost seemed like one bad thing has happened um, after another. Um, the tornadoes, I remember, that ravaged through Mount Juliet and Lebanon back in March. When I was at Laverne just a few months ago, one of our elders, um, his niece and, and their entire family was killed in, in Cookville. Um, such, such a tragic thing um, to, to hear that kind of news. Um, and then, of course, we've been, we've been experiencing all the effects of the coronavirus, the, um, the shutdown, the, maybe the loss of jobs, um, all of the negative things that have been coming along with that. And we've been seeing about uh, riots and civil unrest in, in the streets, um, especially in our, in our big cities in, in the United States. And just, just recently, uh, just this past week, I know personally of two people um, that tragically lost their life. One of them is a good fa family friend who was uh, just trimming trees last Sunday um, and, uh, and fell and, and, and was tragically killed. Um, another one I went to Freed Hardeman with, he's just a little bit younger than me. He's about 25 years old, and he tragically passed away um, this past week. Life is filled with both good news but at the same time, there's a lot of bad news that comes in life. Maybe you've um, received bad news. Maybe recently, maybe you've gotten that phone call that nobody wants to hear. Maybe you've buried a loved one and experienced tragedy and loss in which nobody wants to experience. Life is filled with both good news and bad news. However, the joy of the Christian and the, the soul-refreshing joy that is ours in Jesus Christ is that the good news always triumphs over the bad news no matter how bad, no matter how terrible, no matter how horrible that bad news may be. The good news always conquers and always triumphs if I give myself to it. We're continuing this morning a series that I'm going to be doing for the next, uh, just the next couple weeks, weeks on Sunday morning and Sunday night called I Believe. I want every single one of you to know, since I'm new here and, and we're still getting to know each other, I want you to know what I believe. I want you to know um, central uh foundational principles that I adhere to and that are deeply rooted um, and, and, and I am convicted of. I want you to know uh, what 
I believe. But, but not, not just, I, I don't want you just to know it, but I want these to be, the, these are doctrines, these are core teachings that I want all of us um, to embrace and to come to the knowledge of um, and to grow closer together in. So this morning, I want to talk about uh, the fact of the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news always triumphs over the bad news in life. And the source, the very source of that good news is what we are going to talk about this morning. And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the source of our good news. Now before we dive into talking about Jesus and and everything that he means to us and what he's done for us and what he's provided for us, we're going to be talking about all of those things this morning. I first want to back up and talk about, instead of talking about the good news of Jesus first, I want to take a step back and talk about the bad news. The Bible, like life, the Bible is filled with both good news and bad news. The Bible's filled with ups, highs. The Bible's filled with bad news, lows. And to understand in, when, when we read Scripture and, and when, we, when we grow in our knowledge of it, to understand how good the good news is, to, under, to understand how good the good news of Jesus Christ is, we must understand how bad the bad news is. So I want to back up just for a few moments and talk about the bad news of the Bible. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we first learn about the bad news, um, the main problem, the main conflict within Scripture within this chapter in Genesis chapter 3. Now we know that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and everything was good. He pronounced his creation good. He created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. He created the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field. He created man and after he, 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 after he finished all of his creation he pronounced it good. It was, it was perfect. It was pleasing to him. There was no such thing as um, as sin that dwelt within the hearts of humanity. Humanity, were, were they, they partnered with God. They ruled over creation in a perfect union, a perfect matrimony together. And we read about in Genesis chapter 3 that a problem is introduced, a wrench is thrown into the system. Look with me in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. God created the world good. God created the world in perfection. But that wasn't enough for humanity. Humanity wanted something more. Humanity wanted to define good and evil, right and wrong, how they saw it, not how God had given it to them. They wanted to create for themselves another standard that God had not created and follow it. They wanted to call good what God had called evil. And they wanted to call evil what God had called good. We see in the first pages of the Bible the main conflict, the main problem that runs throughout the entirety of Scripture is introduced. And that problem is sin. I want to talk for a few moments about what sin is. Because this is the crux of the bad news within the Bible. There's three Greek words within the New Testament that that 
portray sin, that deal with sin. One of them, one of them is anomia. It's found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, and it, and it literally means lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is doing that which is the opposite, that which is contrary to the standard that God has put in place. It's the opposite of right doing. Another Greek word that's used to describe sin in the New Testament is hamartia, and its, and its Hebrew equiv equivalent is kata. And it means it's, it's the most frequent usage within the New Testament and in the Old Testament. And it literally means to miss the mark. Now, when you first hear this definition, to, to miss the mark, and, and when I first started studying this, it kind of, it kind of sounded like, you know, like, like, you, like you see the picture on the screen of a, of a dartboard and a dart, and, you know, I'm throwing the dart at the dartboard, and I just, I miss it. I, I accidentally miss, miss the mark. The idea here, however, is not an accidental miss. Um, a something that's done uh, by by accident or, or not meaning to that's not the idea the idea to miss the mark hamartia is a deliberate decision to break God's law it's a it's it's a decision that I have made in my heart knowing good and full well what God has proclaimed and what God has said but I choose to do the opposite instead I miss the mark. I commit a martia. And the last Greek word that's used to describe sin is adikeo. And literally it means unrighteousness. It's the negating word for righteousness in the New Testament. It means the opposite of right doing. God has set a standard in place and told us what it is that he wants us to do. That has he has defined holiness and goodness and beauty and perfection. Sin is doing the opposite of what I know to do is right. It's doing the opposite of what is right. It is unrighteousness. Now, there's several things that happen, that happen to a person who commits sin, who commits anomia, homartia, adikeo. There's two things specifically that happen within the heart of the one who commits sin. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. This comes after the Apostle Paul has just quoted the prophet Isaiah. He says, there's none righteous. No, not one. No one does good. All of them seek after their own pleasures and follow their own heart. And their good deeds are like filthy rags. Paul quotes the prophet Isaiah who says that. And then he says this in Romans chapter 3 verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. When one breaks the law, he stands in a wrong relationship with that law. If I'm speeding and a police officer pulls me over and gives me a traffic ticket and, and summons me to appear in court, I've broken the law. I stand in a wrong relationship with the standard that has been put in place by our government. And I must make that right to be able to continue my life, to be able to continue forward. I must pay the penalty. I am guilty when I break the law. And it's the same with God's law. It's the same principle. It's the same concept. When free will sinners knowingly choose to rebel, to go their own way, and to choose wrong instead of right, which God, then violate God's standard, they become guilty in the eyes of God. And it's at that moment when one commits sin that they are in no longer a right relationship with the law. They are in a wrong relationship. And that wrong must be made right. So when one sins, when one commits sin, unrighteousness, to miss, when, when they miss the mark, 
that must be made right, and they are guilty in the eyes of Almighty God. Now another thing happens when a person commits sin. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. In just a moment, we're going to be going back to verse 1 in chapter 2. So hold your finger there on Ephesians chapter 2. We're first going to read verse 3, though. Paul says, Among whom we all once live in the, lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, like I said, all of us are free will creatures. God has given us the ability to choose right and wrong. We have the capacity to make the choice to follow, either follow God's law or break God's commandment. We have free will, and we're born good. When we are born, when a baby is born into the world, that baby is perfect. That baby is sinless. That baby is guiltless. But when we choose to sin, and we allow sin to take over and reign in our hearts, something happens. Something sinister happens. The Bible says that when we give ourselves to sin, we become corrupted. Spiritual sickness sets in within my heart. And a vicious, sinful nature, a vicious, sinful cycle gives rise to more and more sinful acts. And we, can, we don't even need the Bible to know this. We can see this through experience. We can see the depravity of mankind, how we have, how we have chosen to follow the course of more sinful and sinful acts we can see this within our daily life. And the more one gives themselves to sin and follows down the path of sin farther and farther and farther away from God, the more desensitized to it they become. What is evil becomes good in their mind and what is good becomes evil. Sin causes spiritual sickness. It causes guilt and it causes one's heart to be corrupted, giving rise to more and more sinful acts. And that's not the only thing. Sin also brings forth death. Paul says that the wages of sin is death. And that death, the Bible teaches us, takes three forms. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You should already be there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul, talking to the Ephesians, he says, And you were dead, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead in your sins and your trespasses. I've seen people who were deceased before. I've seen what a dead body looks like. It's lifeless. There's no life. There's no, you see, you see the person's face. There's no color. There's no motion. There's no movement. The person has no life. The Bible teaches that sin separates humans from the very source of life, which is God himself. And the one in their sins who is guilty and who has not dealt with that, in which, in which we are going to talk about in a moment, cannot respond positively to God. The one in their sins cannot be pleasing to God, who bears iniquity and who has undealt with sin. They have no spiritual life, the one who's in their sin. They are alienated from God. They are dead spiritually. There's another aspect of this death that sin brings, and that's physical. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. This is what happens after the story that we just read. God pronounces a curse on humanity. He says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust 
you shall return. We are doomed to die physically because of sin's entrance into the world. All of the funerals that I go to, all of the death and decay of life, of bodies that I see, is because sin has entered into the world. Sin is a curse. And the last, the last aspect of death that sin brings about is it causes not only spiritual death, not only physical death, but eternal death. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. John says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The second death. The lake of fire. The Bible teaches that those in their sins, those who are guilty, those who are spiritually sick, in the eyes of a holy, good, perfect God, are destined to spend eternity away from Him. Jesus teaches more about hell than any other prophet in the Bible. We often like to talk about Jesus teaching us about love and grace and mercy. I love talking about those things. But one of the things that we often overlook is how many times Jesus warns us of hell, of spending eternity away from God, eternal death. Satan, Satan hates it. Satan absolutely hates it when we talk about hell because he's doing everything that he can right now to get as many people to spend eternity with him as possible. And possibly one of the most hateful things that you can do to someone is not warn them about eternal death, about hell. Sin's desire is inside of you. Sin in the Bible is personified as an animal that's crouching at the door, ready to pounce. What it does, it's, it, it attempts to deceive you. It attempts to deceive me into thinking that my will is better than God's and that my will is going to cause more peace and more happiness and more contentment and more pleasure in life then following God's will and the eventual end of it is always destruction, heartache, chaos, and death. The bad news, my brothers and sisters, is that humanity has found sin more pleasurable than God and is being destroyed by it. Sin has entered the world and corrupted the hearts of humanity and has corrupted God's good creation. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't take a long look around at the world to see the damage that's been caused by sin. You look in your, your life, mo most, of, mo most of the heartaches and the pains and the sorrows and all of the negative experiences that you have on a daily basis most of the time is either due to your sin or the sin of another person. Turn on the news, walk down the street, go to the grocery store, you'll see the damage that sin has caused in the lives of God's creation and of God's good world. The problem of sin in our world is the bad news. And to understand how good the good news is, we have to understand how bad the bad news is. We know when we, um, when we talk about God and when we look inside the character of God, uh, God, God, God doesn't want anybody to perish. God doesn't want anyone to spend eternity away from Him. God doesn't want anyone to die. God doesn't want anyone to be spiritually dead, to physically die, to be eternally separated from Him. We look inside the character of God and we see that He has compassion. He has love for His creation and He desires a relationship with all of humanity. God warns us of sin and of hell because 
He loves us. And and the beautiful story of Scripture, the magnificent story of the Bible is that God has set a plan, a scheme of redemption into motion to redeem humanity and solve the problem that humans have created because of their sin. That's part of the good news that even in the very beginning, God set a plan in motion to solve the problem. And we see within the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament tells us from from Genesis to Malachi, it testifies to us that someone is coming. There's going to be someone come in the future that's going to reverse the effects of sin and death and make all things new. We read about this person in in just a few verses um, prior to the first sin in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Turn there with me, if you will. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The very first, what's called messianic promise. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his head heal. God set this plan, this scheme of redemption into motion in the garden and and promised that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the snake, destroying evil, defeating sin and death forevermore. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, just a few pages over. Look in verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. We're introduced to the man Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now we see that God chooses a certain people. He chooses Abraham and then he makes a nation out of him and promises that that this person, the seed of the woman that's going to come through the line of Abraham is going to be a blessing not just to Abraham, not just to his nation, not just to his physical descendants, but to the entire world. This person is going to come through the line of Abraham and bring a blessing to the whole world. And the implication is that he is going to defeat evil and defeat sin and defeat death. Look with me in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. Another promise of this one to come. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. God makes a promise to David. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this chosen people through the line of Abraham, this chosen people, God will establish an eternal kingdom and invite all nations and all tongues and all tribes, everyone from the entire world to join in this kingdom and be washed clean of their sins and to experience eternal life with God. Look with me skipping forward to Isaiah chapter 9. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 through 7. Isaiah builds upon this promise and he says, for to us, he prophesies, he says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. A mighty king, Isaiah prophesies, will sit on this throne, this eternal throne that's prophesied about in 2 Samuel 7 and reign over this good world, having dealt with the problem of sin and death among his people. 
This is good news. This is good news that's pointing to the reversal effects of the problem that we all face. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 through 6. Building upon the promise of someone to come even more. Isaiah 53, verse 5 through 6. But he, this mighty king, this wonderful counselor, mighty God, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This mighty king who will establish an eternal throne, who will come through the line of, who will come from the descendants of Abraham, will defeat sin, not in a way that we would expect, not by gathering an army and conquering the Romans or any other evil nation, not by force, not by violence. This king will defeat the problem of sin and evil by suffering, by dying, and paying the price himself for the sins of the entire world. And of course, we know that this person in the New Testament is revealed as Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, who Scripture teaches was both fully human. He was fully human. He was like you. He was just like you. He drank water. He ate bread. He, he did daily activities. He had a profession. He was like you in every respect. He was tempted, yet he passed the test. Jesus was fully human like we are. But on the flip side of the coin, he was also fully God. The fullness of deity was pleased to dwell inside of him. Jesus was fully God, fully human. And Jesus, while he was on the earth, he taught us that, that all people, no matter where they come from, no matter who they are, no matter what country or nationality that they are a part of, are created in the image of God and are special and are worth saving and are worth inviting into the family of God. He taught us that all people are created in God's image. Jesus taught us that real power doesn't come through living at the expense of another person. That's what sin tells us to do. Sin tells us that if you want to if you want to be powerful in this world, you live at the expense of other people. You abuse people. You lord over people. Jesus taught us, however, that real power comes through sacrifice and generosity. Jesus taught us that true peace, peace that surpasses understanding, only comes through self-giving love, through self-giving sacrifice. And while Jesus was on the earth, fully God, fully human, like what we've been talking about this morning. He confronted the sins of this world. He confronted the, the religious leaders, and he, con he confronted, he confronted the, the, the sins of humanity, warning them to turn, to repent, to repent or perish, turn to God and live Salvation is here. There's an eternal kingdom that's here that's only provided through me, he says. And they hated him. They hated him for it. And eventually, they killed him. They scourged him. Roman scourging was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And they nailed him to a cross. And he bore the wrath of God on his shoulders for you and for me. Jesus died to solve the problem of our guilt. All people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you say that you have not sinned, you are a liar. All people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when Jesus died upon the cross, He died to solve the problem of our guilt. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. It says, Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. We are justified. 
We are justified before God because of Jesus Christ. That means that God can legally pronounce us guiltless. God can legally pronounce us clean. And instead of being in a wrong relationship with the law, I can be in a right relationship with God and have my guilt removed from me because of what Jesus has done. It's like if, say, say if you got a speeding ticket and you appear before a judge and that judge steps upon his, his, his seat he has his, his black robes and his gavel. He smacks the gavel down and he says, guilty, the, pot, the fine must be paid. And then all of a sudden that judge out of love and compassion steps down. He takes off his robe and he pulls out the necessary amount of money out of his pocket and gives it to you and pays your fine. You are justified. You are guiltless. Your fine has been paid. Jesus Christ was what the Bible calls a propitiatory sacrifice. He was the propitiation for our sins. His sacrifice was one that turned away the wrath of God from me. I was destined to have God's wrath poured out upon me eternally and to spend an eternity away from Him in outer darkness and gloomy darkness the Bible talks about. But Jesus paid my fine. Jesus bore the wrath of God. He was the propitiation for me. Jesus died to solve the problem of our guilt. Jesus also rose from the grave so that we may be healed of our spiritual sickness. Colossians chapter 2 verses 12 through 13 says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. A resurrection. There's a, there's a resurrection that takes place within the waters of baptism. A resurrection of the, of, of the dead soul, of the spiritually dead soul that was once alienated from God, that was once separated from God, is now revived, is now resurrected, is now restored. And when we are baptized into Jesus Christ and we begin a relationship with Him, we begin a process, the Bible teaches, of what's called sanctification. And we'll talk about that in later sermon series. But the Bible teaches that when I begin a relationship with Jesus, I begin a process of becoming fully like Jesus Christ, of becoming fully like He is, to be completed on the last day when I'm physically resurrected from the grave as Jesus was, Him being the first fruits of the resurrection. Jesus rose from the grave so that we may be healed of our spiritual sickness. And we know that Jesus gives the gift of eternal life, eternal life to those who submit to him in faith and repentance and baptism. The bad news that we've talked about is that man, man can't defeat sin on their own. There is nothing, there is nothing that you can do to earn the favor of God. There's no amount of good works. There's no amount of good deeds. There's absolutely nothing that you can do to find favor in God's eyes by your own works. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus has the power to defeat sin. Jesus being fully human he defeated temptation, the only human who ever did. He has the power to defeat even your sin. The bad news is that sin has separated God and humanity. Spiritual death has occurred because of sin, a separation, an alienation from God. But the good news is that Jesus restores the relationship between God and humanity. The bad news is that sin has brought forth death into the world. Sin has brought forth death, but Jesus has defeated death by rising from the grave on the third day. The bad news is that sin tempts us to stray from God. Even us Christians, 
We still, we still sin sometimes. We still uh, commit iniquity and transgression, and we're still tempted. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus fights for us in our weaknesses, in, in our weaknesses and has promised to help us all along the way if we submit to him in faith. My brothers and sisters, this morning, this soul-refreshing good news is yours. It's a free gift. And that good news is that salvation from sin is found in Jesus Christ. And not only is it found in Jesus Christ, but it is found in Him alone. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There's no other path to God. No other world religion. No other, no, no other secular remedy that you could, uh, that you could hope to apply to yourself that would, pro- that would solve the problem of sin. There's no other path to God but through Jesus Christ. And this good news, this soul-refreshing good news, if you allow it to infiltrate your heart, to control your actions and your decisions, and if you allow Jesus to transform you continually into His image, into His full likeness, if you submit to this good news, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what bad news comes in this life. The good news of Jesus Christ and salvation from sin and Him being with me even in my fleshly body and guiding me and lifting me up when I fall and when I'm weak. That good news triumphs over what ever bad news may come in our life. And it doesn't matter how bad the bad news is. The good news is that there's salvation in Jesus Christ. And I believe with all of my heart that Jesus has the power to transform the heart that was once corrupted because of sin into a soft heart of flesh, into something beautiful, into something holy, into something that can have a relationship with God into something pure. And I hope all of us this morning embrace the good news of Jesus Christ and allow it to guide our life. If you do, the Bible promises you that you will for certain experience a peace that surpasses all understanding. This morning, if you have any need, if you don't know Jesus Christ, we urge you, come, come forward, learn about Him. Um, if you wish to begin a relationship with Him, um, come forward this morning and we can help you with that. If you wish prayers from the church, um, if, if you are struggling with something, maybe you have received bad news recently and you would like to um, have prayers uh, from the good people here for you, uh, we urge you, please come forward this morning as we stand and as we sing. Are you a soul that's aching? Rest from the burden you bear. Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard?